Hello everyone. So today we study another Mulaskan class that is Cephalopoda. Now Cephalopoda means head footed mullas that is they use their head region as the locomotor comes that is cephalopoda to mean a group of mollusks which use their head region for locomotion the earliest known cephalopoda till date is from the late cambrian and the scientific name of that cephalopoda is plectronoceras that is a uh, genus name now cephalopods are very important group of organisms and very important mollusk all the cephalopods till date reported they are entirely marine so none of the cephalopod group of organisms they did not move to the freshwater like ponds or rivers or even into the land like the um, other molluscan group that bivalves and gastropods did instead all the cephalopods they strictly remain into the marine realm now cephalopods are highly evolved among all the mollusk they have properly developed head they have a very good brain they have well elaborated sensory organs even they have well developed eyes so can they can uh, distinguish different colors also and lastly they are highly mobile that means no cephalopod till they deported they are sessile that is they are not fixed to a certain uh, place fixed to a certain uh, area they can move from one place to another place and they can move in a very fast manner so they are the fast swimmers another important thing that is all the cephalopods are swimmers that means they have nectonic life habit now cephalopods they in their early evolutionary history they develop some kinds of uh, effective measure so that they can control their buoyancy very well within the entire uh, sea water column and they maintain this buoyancy by using their entire shell in such way that they can move within the water column that means they can actively swim within the water column this swimming behavior or this nectonic life habit of cephalopods enables them to get access to a certain area or to a certain column of the ocean water body where there is ample amount of food available to them and all the cephalopods are predators that means they um, hunt they attack their prey they hunt their prey and take them as food in contrast when we study the bivalves and gastropods they are mostly deposit feeder or suspension feeder so all the food particles which suspended in the uh, the animals take the nutrient rich water within them and they from that they filter the nutrient from that water instead cephalopods hunt their uh, prey and for that they have to chase them they have to do effectively swim in a fast manner within the water column and lastly all the cephalopods are univalved that is their entire shell material is composed of a single calcareous shell 
and the cephalo port cells are bilaterally symmetrical that means their shell unlike the gastroboards their shell can be divided bilaterally into two equal halves now as i already told the term cephalopoda comes from the greek words that is kephale or often we call it as cephalon that means head and the other part that is podos which means foot so they have they are modified foot which is actually concentrated in the head region or cephalic region of their body and it forms a funnel that rapidly removes water from the mental cavity of their body when the cephalopod moves so close to the head region or near the head region they have a funnel shaped apparatus which is known as hyponome uh, we will come to later slides about the detailed swimming activity uh, so from that funnel that is from that hyponome they rapidly removes water through some jets into the uh, sea water column and due to the thrust they moved into the opposite direction so in this way cephalopod can actively swim in a very fast manner within the water column now here are some of the cephalopod groups we find in uh, present day as well as in the fossil record so within class cephalopoda there are mainly six uh, subgroups or subclasses the squids octopus cuttlefish these are all living so till date they are found in the um, ocean water and uh, they have a straight lined uh, shell shape and in these cases all are all have their hard parts internally so squids octopus and cuttlefish all have their hard parts internal whereas the nautilus and ammonite they are the coiled form within the cephalopods and these two groups they have their hard part external whereas again the last group that is the belemnite they have their hard part internal and this belemnite and the ammonite is now extinct they gone extinct at the kt boundary mass extinction but nautilus they as have still survived they are still found in the present day ocean nautilus appeared in the cambrian period and till date they continue their journey so these four groups nautilus squids octopus and cuttlefish they are till date found in the recent day oceans in contrast ammonites and belemnites are the cephalopods which we get mainly as fossil record and they became extinct at the kt boundary mass extinction in terms of hard part presence the ammonites and nautilus they have their hard part external whereas the squids octopus cuttlefish and belemnite they have their hard parts internal now the largest invertebrate known on earth is a giant squid that is a cephalopod whose name is architectetes and it can reach the length of about 60 feet with a weight of nearly a ton so we can imagine that how big they are so how dangerous they may look when they come to uh, when they came close to our eye the giant squid has the largest eye of all the animal kingdom they have about 25 cm in diameter this is the diameter of the eye of that giant squid 
As I already told, cephalopods are very fast swimmers. They swim by expelling water from their mantle through the hyponome by some jet propulsion method. All the cephalopods have a centralized, well-developed brain, the largest of all invertebrates and highly developed eyes and other sense organs. They are able to remember, they are able to learn through trial and error. So that is why cephalopods are known one of the well-developed, most well-developed, most well um, organized among all the mollusks even among uh, even uh, it is one of the most highly developed invertebrates also found in the uh, ocean water column now cephalopod exhibits many their territory that means they have a very uh, well organized well complex behavior to defend themselves from any attack that means from their predators the octopus and squids they expel some kinds of ink from the ink sac as a defensive behavior so that is a chemical which is secreted from a gland that is known as ink sac and that basically uh, paralyze or that uh, acts as a uh, sudden a hazy that becomes hazy to these uh, creators so that the cephalopods that means the octopus and squids they get some time to escape the attack and move to another safe place octopus also use their sharp beaks and strong tentacles to capture the harm prey as we know that octopus have some large tentacles um, by which they often can capture their prey also they are one of the ocean's most powerful predators these octopus cephalopods have an amazing ability to change color very rapidly so they can um, cope up or they can change their body color with the substrate to hide or to mimic within the substrate so that they can hide from their predators. They accomplish this feat using numerous pigmented field bags called chromatophores. Their soft part is basically uh, composed of numerous pigmented field bags, numerous small glands, which are known as chromatophores. And this, from this chromatophore, some kinds of, uh, or these chromatophores basically acts as a uh, gland by which they can mimic themselves to other substrates. Now within class, and these three subclass is within our syllabus. The first subclass is called Nautiloidia. Often we call them as their nickname as Nautilus. Basically, Nautilus is a genus name within Nautiloidia. Uh, we often call them as Nautiloids. The second subclass is Ammonoidia, or we often call them as Ammonoids. And the third group or third subclass is known as Coleoidia, that is the group Belemnites this one is the coleoidea it's an uncoiled shell straight line uh, belemnite is one example or one group fall within the coleoidea so th these three subclass we have to study in our graduate undergraduate syllabus now coming to some basic morphologies of cephalopods cephalopods we all know that cephalopods belongs to the group mollusk within mollusk cephalopod is an important uh, class and we as we all know that all the mollusks they follow the european parameter by which they can uh, they will coil around an axis so all the cephalopods they are mostly planispiral although there are some forms which are conispiral and 
some cephalopods are also found which are even uncoiled so there is no coiling there as you can see in this picture this is a choristoceras from the triassic period which is a coiled cephalopod and this coiling is occurring within a single plane so that is plane spiral here ostlingoceras from the cretaceous here it is coiled but the coiling occur with changing the coiling plane looks like a gastropod and this is known as cone spiral or helically coiled cephalopod although it looks like a gastropod but there are some uh, morphological features by which we can easily distinguish these kinds of cone spirally coiled cephalopods from the gastropods because at a glance it looks most uh, like a gastropod but there are some features which we will come later uh, into our later slides by which we can easily distinguish them and the last one that is the uncoiled forms these are relatively rare but although rare these are uh, very frequently uh, found in the paleozoic times these are also available uh, in the fossil record now coming to the morphology of cephalopods like the gastropods in cephalopods also a complete 360 degree rotation around the axis of coiling is known as hold the first formed cephalopod shell that is in the embryonic stage the shell formed in a cephalopod is known as is protoconch and rest of the shell that is after the protoconch up to which the cephalopod leaves all the uh, hard part is known as cephalopod shell not phragmocone it's called cephalopod shell the within the cephalopod shell you can see that only in the last portion where the cephalopod soft mass leave that is called body chamber it's not a complete 360 degree rotation it's a part this much portion so only in this much portion as you can see in this picture also from starting from here to here only in this much portion the entire soft mass the entire all the organs of the organism they rest they remain within this much portion of the cephalopod shell so this portion of the cephalopod shell where the cephalopod body rest this is known as body chamber and apart from body chamber all the pre previous shells all the previous portion of the shell that is known as phragmocone so this phragmocone also includes the protoconch part okay now of the living chamber that is or you may say often the, it is the opening of the entire shell also uh, particularly for the living chamber or body chamber this opening is known as aperture so that is the portion by which the cephalopod organism cephalopod uh, soft mass maintain their contact with the external world so that is the uh, portion by which they came out and go inside the shell like opercula in gastropods in cephalopods also they have to close their opening like in gastropods they close their aperture with a calcareous plate which is known as opercula in cephalopods also cephalopods close their aperture with a single plate or often with a pair of plates and this is known as aptyche we consider the 
entire shell that is particularly excluding the uh, body chamber where the um, soft body mass of the organism uh, rest the rest of the part of the cephalopod shell that is the phragmocone part they are divided with numerous partition walls and that partition walls is composed of uh, calcareous material so this calcareous material like you can see in this picture there is an internal view so this is the last partition wall and in the frontal part of this partition wall is the body chamber sorry this is the body chamber and before the body chamber that is in the posterior part of the body chamber the entire phragmocone portion of the shell is segmented or is divided with numerous calcareous plates to some uh, small chambers to some small uh, blocks these partition walls are known as septum and each of these septum they are connected with the outer shell through a line the line joining the septum with the inner portion of the uh, cephalopod shell is known as its suture so that is basically uh, suture is basically the junction line between this septum and the cephalopod shell in the inner side
now each of the previously formed chambers or camera is connected with the body hole that tube is known as siphuncle so basically this tube piercing each and every septum of each chamber or each camera and connected the body chamber with the extreme posterior most chamber so through this tube through this siphuncle the body chamber is connected to the extreme innermost chamber of the cephalopod shell this tube is known as siphuncle now each siphuncle or uh, the siphuncle they have to pierce the septum so this portion of the uh, septum from where the siphuncle pass there we found a perforation or a hole which is known as foramen simply foramen or it is often known as siphuncular opening and during piercing or it is often found that a portion of the septum is extending towards posterior side or towards anterior side surrounding the siphuncle this portion is known as siphuncle or it is known um, this portion is basically the extended portion of the septum around the foramen and it is known as septal neck now the septal neck may be projecting forward in that case we call those as proquanitic septal neck or it is found that the septal neck is projecting backward that is in the posterior side in that case we call them as retroquanitic septal neck now in nautiloids all the nautiloids septal neck is retroquanitic in nature whereas in all ammonites the septal neck is forwarding in nature that is projected forward you can see in this picture that here it is the tube and this tube piercing or perforating this septum so a portion of the septum is you can see in this backward portion in the posterior part is projected this projected part is known as septal neck and you can see this uh, tube is continue in all throughout all the septum by piercing all the septum and all septum have a septal neck which is uh, posteriorly projected and through this tube uh, the body chamber is connected with all the previous chambers so it is the side cephalopod body mass they have their connectivity with the fast formed chambers or with the fast formed camera now you can see this whitish portion within the previous chambers or within the camera this is this part this is the cameral fluid this fluid may be gas or this fluid may be liquid and sometimes there we found some kinds of mineral precipitation also in the earlier chambers or in the earlier uh, camera so when the earlier chambers are partially filled with some kinds of mineral precipitation we call them as cameral deposits now the function of siphuncle in cephalopod uh, is extremely important because as i already told you that cephalopods are active swimmers now cephalopods they take the water from the marine water column through the mantles through this uh, mantles from here and they uh, wash out their gills 
uh, within the mental cavity to for the res uh, respiratory exchange that is they take oxygen and um, remove all the excretors with the excess water now that excess water here, sorry this is not the portion in this portion here you can see the black line this portion they will uh, take the uh, marine water and here you can see that this um, water goes they will fill they will wash the gills then respiratory exchange occurs and the rest of the water now forcefully ejected out into the marine water through this narrow channel or through this tube this tube is known as hyponome so from this hyponome cephalopods powerfully eject out the excreta rich water into the surrounding water body and due to that a thrust generated and by that the cephalopod moves in the opposite direction of the thrust now of buoyancy control during swimming of the cephalopod cells and it is thought previously that cephalopod controls their buoyancy by incorporating some fluids within the earlier chambers or within the earlier camera so when cephalopod needs to go down that is they have to vertically move deeper within the sea they fill their earlier chambers with water that makes the cephalopod shell little heavy whereas when the cephalopod needs to move up within the water body then they eject this water from the chambers or from the cameries and in uh, exchange they fill these earlier chambers with gas so that becomes uh, lighter so that the cephalopod can uh, float and comes to the above part of the uh, water column so by this way with uh, continuously filled up with water or gas cephalopod makes it entire uh, shell or makes it entire body becomes heavy so that they can go downward or sometimes they filled with the earlier form chamber uh, fill the earlier chambers with gaseous material or with gas so that they becomes lighter and cephalopod can uh, easily float and they go upward so in this way with successive uh, filling of water and gas cephalopod control its vertical movement and with the jet propulsion method through the hyponome cephalopod can, can move laterally now the exchange of water or gas with the earlier chambers or with the earlier camera is happening through this siphuncle so this is the organ this is the tube by which the body chamber is joined with the earlier chambers and through this siphuncular tube or through this siphuncle the gaseous or liquid exchange within the uh, earlier chambers is happening now the filling up of gas or or by uh, or liquid in the earlier chambers is previously thought that they will help in vertical movement of the cephalopod shell but in recent experiments it was found that this process this filling up process of the earlier chambers with gas or with liquids according to their necessity this process is very very slow so cephalopod cannot move vertically by filling the earlier chambers with gas or liquid very frequently so this process is not uh, occurring very uh, 
rapidly, very frequently, by which cephalopod can easily move up and down. So instead, this process is effective for a long term movement or long term change in bathymetry. But for a ready movement, ready change in vertical depth within the water column, cephalopod has to tilt their body and through the jet propulsion method, through the jet ejection from the hyponome, they can move upward or move downward. Here you can see, uh, this is the body chamber with the soft mass with the eye, the tentacles, and here you can see the hyponome, just at the uh, outer peripheral part. And these are the septums, within septums there are piercing, uh, pierced portion, that is the septal neck, and through this septal neck, through this uh, foramen, a tube pass, and it is connected from the first form chambers also. So this is the siphuncle, and these are the successive chambers and septum. Now, the suture, which is basically the trace of the septum uh, on the cell surface in the inner side, the suture may be of various types. The suture in its simplest form are straight line. Now, here the straight line is drawn considering from one end of the uh, hole to the other end. So, when it is a curved surface, each hole, so it starts from here, it starts from its uh, inner part of the hole and ends at the opposite side, inner part of the hole. Now, we trace this line along this curved surface and after that, we unfold the paper. So, then it looks like in these manners. So, when the suture lines are at its simple, that is they are almost straight line, we call them as orthoceratitic suture. In the next case, the suture lines, you can see some broad curvature, smooth curvature. And in this smooth curvature, you may find there are some portions which are pointed or which are convex towards the growing direction, towards the anterior direction. This arrow is indicating the growing direction or the direction of aperture. So the convex portion within this curved suture line, which is pointed the convex side which is pointed towards the aperture or towards the growing direction that pointed portion is no so this portion is basically this is the convex side and this side is pointing towards the aperture or towards the anterior direction or towards the growing direction whereas at its side you may find some concave portion which are pointing towards aperture this concave part is known as lobe. So the convex part facing towards aperture is known as saddle and the concave part facing towards aperture is lobe. Now in orthoceratitic suture, it is the most simplest form, straight line, no saddle and lobe. In the next type, that is the nautilitic suture, here the suture is broadly folded with some broad curvatures consist of smoothly rounded saddle and lobes. In the third type that is in the goniatitic part, the saddles are still rounded whereas the lobes becomes angular. In the fourth type that is the serratitic part, suture, the saddle still becomes rounded, still convex towards the aperture and lobes becomes intricately frilled, very minutely folded. You can see very minute wrinkles. So the lobes are very minutely wrinkled in serratitic suture and saddle still remains broadly rounded. And the most complex suture found in cephalopod that is known as the ammonitic suture where both saddle and lobes are minutely or finely folded or finely wrinkled. 
that is known as the ammonitic suture now the suture in ammonite is very very important because often the nature of suture is very helpful to differentiate the different groups of cephalopods into uh, different taxonomic uh, classification system even in terms of age the suture is very important you can see that certain sutures appeared and restricted to certain uh, specific times notulate sutures this is not very good time diagnostic because notulates appeared in cambrian and till date they will continue so in all geologic ages in all the phanerozoic times you will find uh, notulitic notulitic sutures that is this type and this type these are the very uh, primitive type or very uh, simple type suture found in cephalopods but in this type the goniatitic these are particularly restricted from devonian to permian so strictly restricted within the paleozoic type seratitic suture restricted within late permian to triassic so only two geological periods and not the entire permian the late half of the permian period and the, the triassic period uh, and the ammonitic suture only two periods within the mesozoic time jurassic and cretaceous so these three groups are very much time diagnostic so whenever you may ask that in a rock record you find a seratitic suture so the first thing came into your mind that it is a cephalopod it is a molluscan group which is strictly restricted in marine so that deposit is a marine deposit and that sedimentary deposit must occur within the time frame of late permian to triassic because that is the time when the seratitic suture bearing ammonoids or cephalopods are found in the world here you can see the different types of uh, sutures this is the most primitive and simple type of seratitic suture almost straight lines the notulitic suture with only simple or smoothly carved saddle and lobes this is the convex portion facing towards aperture and this is the concave portion facing towards aperture so this convex portion is saddle and this concave portion is lobe next the goniatitic suture uh, here you can see the saddle portion that is the convex portion facing towards aperture uh, is still smoothly rounded whereas the lobe portion that becomes angular you can see this is the angular portion so this lobe portion becomes angular so this is the goniatitic suture next this one is the seratitic suture this is the aperture direction this side is the aperture you can see the saddle is smoothly rounded but the lobe portion is finely frilled this part that concave part is finely frilled here you can see this part is finely filled whereas the saddle portion that is still smoothly rounded and the last part that is this one side is the aperture direction so you can see all the saddles and lobes in all parts it is consist of numerously fine densely spaced uh, folds or undulations or wrinkles so this is the ammonitic suture now the question is why cephalopod needs some simple cephalopod sutures to these extremely complex forms the answer lies in the cell strength of the cephalopod shell it is found that compared to nautiloids the ammonoids shells are very thin so compared to these two groups which is found mostly these two types sutures are found in nautiloids whereas in ammonites these three types are found 
the goniatitic, seratitic, and ammonitic type. And orthoceratitic and nautilitic suture are found in nautiloids. So, in nautiloids, the shell, the outer shell, is relatively thick compared to ammonoids. Now, to sustain the overburden water pressure, the thin shell of ammonites they have required a supportive organ to protect the um, external shell so that it can resist the external water pressure now to resist the external water pressure so that the shell wall cannot broke that is the organism uh, sustain the water pressure because if the organism fails to sustain the water pressure the shell wall will readily broke and the organism becomes open without any external protection cover without any hard part so it becomes vulnerable to its predators and ultimately it face death so for that the organism requires to maintain a balance between the external water pressure in the cell surface so for that as the cell surface as the cell itself is very thin so for that they require a well supportive organ and to support the cell they intricately fold their septum so that the connecting line between the septum and the shell increase now more and more connecting area between the septum and external shell the more and more support the septum will produce to the external cell so by increasing the contact area between the shell wall and the septum the ammonites provide a solution so that their shell can resist the external water pressure so more and more intricately filled more folding means more surfacial area by which the septum is in contact with the cell surface so that is why it is thought that the cephalopod suture complexity is a product for maintaining the water pressure within the water body because the ammonoids they have very thin outer shell very thin shell cover now if we look at the ammonite shell here it is the lateral view laterally you can see the ammonite shell in this uh, way and you can see the aperture is in below direction so the opening of aperture is in this direction these are the suture very simple suture and this is the apertural view or anterior view in which you can completely see the opening of the last hole so this is the opening of the last hole that is the aperture so this is known as anterior view or more precisely it is known as apertural view because in this view you can only see the uh, entire aperture of the organisms now the portion of the cephalopod hole so this one is one hole this is a outer line of one hole so the portion of the hole which is close to the coiling axis my coiling axis for this case is in lie here so the portion of the hole close to the coiling axis is this part this portion of the hole is known as dorsal side and the portion of the hole 
farthest from the coiling axis is known as ventral side so this is the this side is the ventral side this part and you can also see the siphuncular opening or foramen also in the aperture so that means this is the suture and within the suture you can see the uh, perforations through which the siphuncle passed and this is the perforation uh, or this may be the perforation found in the last uh, septum so that's all for today's class hope you will understand thank you